Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to this uh, course on uh, introduction to robotics where we'll be looking at, uh, we'll be studying various issues uh, which are basic to the study of robotics. Now uh, when you think about uh, robotics or the word robot, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Well, to some of you it would be something like a mechanical arm, for some it could be a toy, some could be uh, a helper, uh, some kind of a mechanical slave or it could be something which is a little devious and uh, something which is uh, uh, could be uh, dangerous. So if you look at uh, basically uh, uh, these pictures which are shown here, so these are various things that come to your mind if you look at, uh, uh, if you hear the word robot. And uh, the first thing that comes to your mind would probably uh, be a mechanical kind of an arm which has, uh, uh, which has uh, uh, mechanical linkages and which is used in the industries for doing uh, works like uh, welding, spot welding and uh, spray painting. Uh, pick and place applications, assembly, etc., etc. To some of us, uh, the word robot would also mean a uh, mechanical toy as shown in this uh, slide where you can see uh, such toys which are uh, readily available in supermarkets. So this is a mobile robot which has wheels, which has uh, uh, powered by a battery. It has, uh, if you look at this figure, it has some kind of a sensor in front to check for obstacles. And if you see the top or what is inside, then essentially there is a microcontroller which is driving uh, the full system which is powered uh, by a battery, a uh, battery, a local power source. So uh, this is also something that comes to our mind when we think about the word uh, robot. The other could be a mechanism which is uh, moving, say for example this has linkages, it is connected by a motor here and uh, this is also a servo motor, there is a gripper at the end and this moves in space to do some task. So these are things that come to our mind. So in this course, essentially we are going to be studying about uh, various aspects of uh, uh, robots, the very basics of it. The first would be uh, uh, the history of robotics, where did robot robots come from and uh, what are robotics, where did the word robot come from. Next is uh, as uh, uh, you would understand that robots essentially move in space. So when they move in space, an arm moves in space to do a particular task. So we need some kind of basic mathematics or what we call basic transformations that uh, correlate the end effector of the robot or the gripper of the robot with the task it is going to do. And that is how the robot controller works. So we'll have to look at some basic elementary transformations. Then forward and inverse kinematics, if it has to pick up an object, uh, how would the robot arm go to that point and after picking up the object, how would it plan its trajectory and come to uh, another point and drop the object. So that is covered in forward and inverse kinematics. Then a robot moves uh, by actuators which are essentially uh, motors, electrical powered motors and uh, the feedback comes from sensors. So we also have to look at sensors, actuators and the full control is done by microcontrollers which actually controls the end effector to go from one point to another point. And uh, these microcontrollers are programmed using uh, uh, language, uh, sometimes uh, C-sharp or uh, some other kind of uh, uh, programming language. And then finally, uh, we'll also have to look at uh, robot programming languages. Now there are some languages like uh, Victor's assembly language which is very specific for robot programming only and these are used in the industry. So here we'll be looking at uh, what, are this, uh, what is the structure of this language and how to use this language to program a robot for industrial applications. And uh, towards the end of the course, what we'll look at is several experiments in robotics. So for example, uh, we had looked at uh, this very simple two-arm manipulator which can move from one point to another point and do a task. It is controlled by a servo motor and then finally by some kind of a controller here. So if you were to make a robot yourself, a mobile arm, uh, sorry, a uh, arm like this, a serial arm which is going to pick up something from this point and put it in some other point, uh, what are the basic uh, things you need like motors, controllers, how are you going to control it? Or if you're making a mobile robot like this, which is going to move on the ground and avoid obstacles using a sensor, an ultrasonic sensor, then what is it that you require or what is it that you need? 
So towards the end of this uh, series of lectures, uh, we have a number of experiments in robotics and after doing the experiments in robotics, you would be able to make your own robot. Not an industrial robot, which is uh, something like this, which is uh, pretty expensive and, uh, exp and uh, complicated, but very simple robots like mobile robots, which can move around, do particular tasks, or an arm like this, which can go to some point and uh, pick an object and drop an object. So that is basically what we are going to, the lectures will cover. And towards the last, we are going to have experiments. And finally, you should be able to make your own very simple kind of robot. So before starting any course, it is, uh, it is customary that we look at the basic uh, origin of the course or the history of the course. So the word robot or uh, robotics as a subject essentially belongs to the uh, area or the subject of automation. So the larger subject is called automation or industrial automation and uh, robotics is a part of automation. And uh, so the first thing that we need to know is when we say automation, what do we mean? Or what does the word automation imply? So automation essentially means replacing human muscular power. So you can have different kind of automation. For example, at home, we can have uh, home automation. In office, we can have office automation. Uh, in industry, we can have industrial automation. So in all these applications, you've, you see that essentially it is human muscular power which is being reduced in some form by using a machine or a mechanism. And uh, interestingly, this uh, uh, business of automation has been going on for thousands of years. Okay, it is not that uh, automation was suddenly invented someday by somebody. So if you look for right from about 10,000 BC or more, human beings were essentially using different kind of tools. For example, we use stone tools, then we use iron tools, then copper tools. And uh, uh, these tools were used to make better tools. And the philosophy here in automation is tools making better tools. And this process of tools uh, making better tools has been going on for uh, thousands of years. As an example, in industries, we can say about NC machines. From NC machines, we have CNC machines. Then we have DNC machines. Then we have SIM in that order. So this process of automation has been going on for thousands of years. It is there even today. And uh, tools are making better tools. Now, if you look at the earliest uh, automation, somewhere around 150 BC of which records are there, uh, such simple automation was there about 150 BC in uh, Greece. This is the earliest example of a steam engine. And how this would work is essentially they would burn, uh, they would burn fire under a container of water. And this water would uh, uh, boil and produce steam. And the steam would come out from these two sides. One is here and the other is there, which will cause, because one of the nozzle is on this side, the other nozzle is on this side. So what would happen? There would be a moment about this axis. And uh, this, uh, this uh, sphere will rotate. Now, this is the earliest example of a steam engine. And if you look at the date, it is somewhere around 150 BC. And uh, similar principles were used in automatic closing and opening of doors. For example, here, this is another example called Heron's door. Again, 150 BC. And how this works is essentially they would burn uh, fire on this container. And uh, this fire would heat up the air inside the container. And the air pressure would increase. And as the air pressure increases inside this container, it is going to force the water. Uh, it will increase the pressure here and force this water down. And the water will flow into this pipe and go onto the other bucket, which is suspended here. Now, when the water level here increases, its uh, weight increases, and because of which uh, it will cause uh, this pulley to rotate. Now, if this pulley rotates, what would happen is this door would open. So this is, again, uh, an example of uh, doing a task without human muscular intervention, which is called automation. So when you burn the fire, the door would op open. When you extinguish the fire, the door would close. And uh, this is an example, the earliest example of, uh, uh, of automation. And if you look at the dates, uh, it was very, very early, about 150 uh, BC. Now, uh, as uh, we progressed further, about 1980s, we saw the automatic creation of uh, uh, the creation of automatic dolls, which could uh, write, draw pictures. And these dolls are still there in several museums around the world. For example, the Robotics Museum in, uh, in Nagoya in Japan still has uh, some of these automatic dolls, which can automatically draw pictures, serve tea. And uh, the date is about 80, 1780 AD. Now, as we progress further, about 1801, uh, uh, in France, this gentleman, James, uh, uh, was an inventor of textile machinery. And what he did is essentially he encoded the designs on textiles in the form of a punch card. Now, how this punch card works is essentially there are holes or no holes. It is very similar to the uh, OMR sheet that we use uh, uh, 
uh, today. So in the OMR sheet, basically we make a bubble or we leave it blank. So it's essentially a zero or a one. And what he did is all the designs that were made in the textiles, he encoded in the form of a program. And uh, this program was read by uh, the, sp the sponge card machine. And it basically consisted of holes or no holes, a series of holes and no holes. And the earlier computers were also, uh, the earlier computers, the earlier NC machines, CNC machines were also run by punch card systems in which there were holes or no holes. And the machine essentially had a reader which could read this and then the machine would operate uh, automatically. So this uh, timeline essentially shows that uh, automation started off very long time ago. It progressed slowly, and uh, we had a very simple automation like uh, moving engine, Heron's door, op uh, automatic dolls. Then James Chirag, uh, 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 sorry, Joseph Ch uh, Jacquard uh, textile machines in France. And as we move further, about 1904, in the year 1904, essentially the idea of transfer lines in which a car was assembled at different stations. And even today, if you go to any car assembly plant, whether it's Tata Motors or it's Maruti, essentially we see how cars are assembled. So the car would be mounted on a conveyor. And uh, uh, at different locations of the conveyor, there would be human beings or there would be robots doing particular applications. So the car would move on the conveyor, and then it'll come and stop at a particular station. The robot will do a task, or a human will do a task, and then the car will move on to the next station. So this idea of uh, transfer line was essentially invented or developed by Henry Ford in the Ford Motor Company in US in 1904. And uh, this is uh, used even today in most of the automobile companies. Now, just for history, and historical interest, where did the word robot come from? So essentially in 1921, uh, this uh, drama writer, Carl Capek, so he wrote a drama or a play in which he said that in future there will be mechanical men replacing uh, human beings to do dirty work in industries, as shown in this uh, figure here, apparently taken from his drama. So he said that in future there would be mechanical men like this who are going to be doing the dirty job of, in, uh, of uh, human beings in, uh, in, uh, in industries and he called them uh, mechanical slaves. And this word robot, essentially in the Czechoslovakian language, means uh, mechanical slave or mechanical man. And this is where the word robot came from. Now, of course, in 1921, there was no robots. But it's interesting that he could imagine that uh, in future there will be robots, and uh, he used this word. So he was the first person who used the word robots. Further, 1942, it was Isaac Asimov who first used the word robotics. And those of you who are interested in movies would know that there are a lot of movies today. iRobot is there. Uh, the future of mankind is there. And Isaac Asimov is the first person who used uh, the word robotics. And he also framed the three laws of robotics. Uh, and uh, it's again interesting that in 1942, there was no robots, and of course, no robotics. But he could uh, imagine that in future, there would be robots, and this is the way it would be. He has written a lot of uh, science fiction, interesting uh, uh, movies have been made out of it, and he's projected what uh, things like robotics, AI would be even in the years, 100 years from now. So for history's interest, uh, for historical interest, the word robot came from here, and the word robotics is uh, attributed to Isaac Asimov, 1942. Now, where did the robot actually come from? So essentially, 1945, during the Second World War, they were uh, making the atom bomb, and for the atom bomb project, they had to handle radioactive material. Okay. And for handling this radioactive material, human beings couldn't handle it because uh, it is radioactive. So they devised a device, a mechanical uh, two arms of this nature. So there would be a slave arm on one side, and on the other side you have a master arm. And uh, there would be a lot of shielding between them and a lot of distance. For example, this would be kept in, uh, in a distant room, and this would be kept at a, another room separated by a thick concrete wall. So the radiation from this side cannot come to this side. And uh, how it is operated is essentially the, the, um, uh, the operator would stand here, and he would hold uh, the, the arm or the gripper and uh, perform motions. For example, if he holds this and moves it on this side, what would happen is uh, the wire rope tension on this uh, cable would get, uh, uh, the tension will change. And this tension will be transferred onto the other side. So if he pulls it on this side, this master also, the slave will also move on this side. Now, something to note here. Essentially, this is strictly a mechanical device. So there is no electronics here. Uh, the uh, motion transmission is by wire rope and pulley, simply by changing the, uh, the tension on either side. And uh, so this is called the must, is called the master-slave uh, manipulator. And it is also called the father of the robot. Now, 
in several atomic energy establishment this is still used because wherever they have to handle radioactive material uh, they have to operate at a distance and this is called a uh, telemanipulator or telemanipulation manipulation at a distance so theory, uh, so in terms of history this is attributed to the father of the robot and this device strictly mechanical device is uh, 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 was uh, developed around 1945 so now the question comes that uh, what changed everything what i mean by that is Mechanical systems became electromechanical. A lot of electronics came in, programming came in, and uh, we had sensors, we have actuators. So invention of what uh, changed everything that mechanical became electromechanical. So if you look at that, then we find that the invention of the transistor somewhere around 1948, 49, uh, gave rise to the concept of reprogram. So before this date, all devices were mechanical devices, and we could not reprogram a mechanical device. Once you have made the arm, you could not change the structure or its program because there was no concept of reprogram. So with the invention of the transistor came the concept of reprogram and you could program a mechanical device and if you change the program it will behave differently. And 1950 show, uh, saw the first generation of the first robot called Shaky at uh, Stanford University which is shown here. So this is a mobile robot which has wheels, has very simple sensors in front and can do very basic path planning. So 1950 invention of the first robot called Shaky. 1952 came George Dowell with his teach and playback devices for NC machines. And uh, so NC machines and robots essentially came from the same technology and uh, that is the invention of the transistor. And uh, uh, so robotics is not very old. So 1950 to about uh, 2000 or 2019 today, it has moved from here to here in about 60 years and uh, the progress has been uh, very, very astounding. For example, this mobile robot can just move around and, uh, and do obstacle avoidance, which is very, very simple. No complex computation. It doesn't have vision. It doesn't have other kind of sensors. Whereas this uh, robot, which has about 54 degrees of freedom, it has uh, very complex sensors. It has vision. It has speech recognition. It has uh, other kind of sensors like gyros, inclination sensors. And it can, uh, it can walk. It can run. It can interact with humans. So 60 years to go from here to here is a very short time actually, but a lot of progress has been made and robotics has moved from such simple devices to very complex devices like this. Now, so the first change, what I'm trying to emphasize here in this uh, uh, in today's lecture on history of robotics is what caused these changes. Now, the first thing that caused the change was the transistor that uh, we had a robot, the creation of the robot, and then it moved from here to here, right? So now, since 1948-49, uh, we had the, what happened was the computer technology, the computers became more and more uh, powerful. So in the earlier days, we had one program which was, being, uh, which was uh, controlling one machine control unit. Here, I mean uh, one machine control unit means uh, one computer, and it was controlling one machine too. So either this is a, a NC machine or it's a robot, but it's one program, one machine, uh, one computer, one machine. Now, as the computer got more powerful, what happened was we could have one computer which is controlling many machines. Okay. So we had uh, a number of programs which are controlling one central computer, and the central computer is controlling several machines. So we have NC, then we have CNC. And uh, as the computer got more and more powerful, about 1970s, what happened is the computer could now control not only one machine, but it could control different types of machines. For example, one computer controlling a machine tool, a machine work table, a machining device, a robot, parts carousel, and it could integrate all of this, do path planning, do motion planning, do uh, scheduling. So essentially what I'm saying is that the computer is getting more powerful and it is being able to control more number of machines. Now, uh, so we have NC, so here we have NC machines, then we have CNC, then we had uh, flexible manufacturing, and as the computer got even more powerful, we have uh, computer integrated manufacturing where the computer controls not only the robots and the, dev and the uh, mechanical devices, but is also integrated with material handling, resource planning, uh, etc. So the computer is more or less taking over the full manufacturing cycle, and this is called computer integrated manufacturing. Now it's important to note here that industrial standards so far, or the types of industries are classified into different uh, groups or uh, in depending on the timeline. So industry 1.0 is essentially earlier days before 1800, where uh, most of the industries 
were run by water power or steam power. For example, industries during uh, those days, 1970s, uh, sorry, about seven, before 1700, uh, uh, the power source or the energy source was essentially water power or steam power. And these industries are basically what we call the first generation industries or industry 1.0. The second generation is where we had electricity and this power source of driving the uh, machines became electricity or electrical motors. And all the industries that are covered under uh, industry 2.0 or 2.0 are essentially falling in this area where the, where the driving element or the, the energy supply is basically electricity. So this is about uh, before 1800. This is after 1800. Okay. This is uh, about uh, 1970. So this is industry 1.0, 2.0, then we have 3.0. Now in 3.0, it is essentially computers which are integrating uh, or automating systems and we call computer integrated manufacturing, computer aided manufacturing, computer and automation or IT, what we call uh, IT. So it's essentially we have machines, uh, then we have computers, we have robots which are integrated and essentially the computers are controlling the machines or automation. This is essentially industry 3.0 uh, and it's about 1970s onwards. Now, uh, so this is 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 and if you come to about uh, 2005, we are in the fourth generation where we say industry 4.0. Now what is the difference between this and this? Here also we have robots, we have automation, we have computers but essentially uh, we also have some other elements. Number one is we have a human in the loop and plus we have some kind of a cyber physical system. So the difference between here and here is here, we have a connection involving machines, humans, and very often AI. So these are what we call cyber physical systems and this is where we are today. And uh, this is from about 2005 onwards and is likely to last for another uh, at least 15 to 20 years more. So uh, what is the fundamental difference between here and here? Is essentially here we have uh, intelligent algorithms, sometimes called machine learning algorithms, and we have humans in the loop. And uh, this is what makes this industry 3.0 different from uh, 4.0. And this is where we are today. Now, we use the word robot uh, quite a few times uh, in today's uh, lecture, but uh, so if we were to ask that what is a robot or how would you define a robot? Now, the interesting thing is nobody seems to agree. Now, why nobody seems to agree is because all the companies who are making devices would like to call their device a robot. It sells better. It has more market value. So even people making wheelchairs would say that's a robot. People making vacuum cleaners will say theirs is a robot also. And students also like to say whenever they do a project or they always like to say that uh, they are working on robotics and this is a robot also. So that is the reason why apparently nobody seems to agree on what should be called a robot. But in general, it's understood that uh, to be called a robot, it should do some or all of the following. For example, uh, the device or the system should move around. Then it should sense and manipulate the environment and it should display some kind of intelligent behavior. So if a system does one or all of this, then essentially we say that uh, the system can be called a robot. Now moving around is very simple. A mobile robot moves around, a vacuum cleaner moves around by itself. So we can call it a robot. Sense and manipulate the environment. It must have some kind of sensory input output. For example, it should sense if there's an obstacle in front and avoid it. Okay. This also vacuum cleaners can do, a lot of wheelchairs can do. So we can call it a robot. Now display intelligent behavior is something which is a little tricky, that what is intelligent behavior? So in one sense, in the sense uh, of what we use in robotics, it essentially means uh, a system would be called intelligent if it can deal with unknown, unforeseen, or corrupted data. So for example, uh, the sensors are not always perfect. Okay. So if sometimes you get data which is incorrect or which is corrupted, or data which is not there, then how would you deal with it? So intelligent behavior in that sense would mean uh, ability to deal with unforeseen, unknown, or corrupted uh, data. So by these three definitions, uh, by these three points, we can classify a system into a robot or not a robot. So for example, a CNC machine uh, is a machine tool. It's not a robot uh, for the simple reason that a CNC machine does not move around. It does not sense and manipulate the environment, and it does not uh, display any kind of intelligent behavior. So. Uh, Whenever we say, if somebody says this is a robot or that is a robot, we can very easily check that it satisfies either of this and then uh, decide whether it's a robot or it's not a robot. So from 19, uh, uh, so with the invention of the transistor 1950, uh, we had uh, uh, till 1970, we had about three generations of robotics. 
Okay, so we had the first generation of robotics. These were very simple pick and place devices which no external sensors. So this is about 1950 to 1970. So the robot could uh, be used in industrial applications for spot welding, spray painting. Uh, and it did not have any external sensors uh, like vision, uh, vision system or other kind of sensors like ultrasonics to be able to interact with the environment. Now the second generation robots are from uh, about 1970s onwards. And these have external sensors, for example, vision, tactile, force torque, and these are for interaction with the environment. So the difference between here and here is, essentially these robots can interact with the environment, whereas these robots cannot. And then from about 1990 onwards, we have third generation robots, which we sometimes call intelligent robots. They are made up of smart materials, sometimes they are biocompatible, etc. And these are called uh, third generation robots, which are about 1990s uh, onwards. And future robots is what we have and what we expect robotics to be. So there are uh, several examples, bio robots, robots which uh, are uh, living inside the body, can be a part of the body, micro, nano, then uh, cyborgs, androids, and so many others as in science fiction. So robotics is essentially divided into uh, these four generations. And this is where we are now. Now, uh, the point of showing this slide essentially is that this, the first generation robots were created essentially because of uh, the invention of the microcontroller or the uh, transistor. Now what gave rise to this and what gave rise to this, that's what we are looking at here. So what gave rise to the second uh, generation or the second revolution, so this we can call the first revolution in robotics caused by the transistor. The second revolution in robotics is essentially electronics became faster, smaller and cheaper. And uh, this is essentially because of the, uh, uh, the invention of VLSI, a very large scale integrated circuits about 1970s because of which all the electronics became smaller, faster and cheaper because you could embed a uh, lot of the uh, earlier vacuum tubes and diodes, you could replace a lot of the diodes, triodes with faster uh, electronic devices and they could be embedded in a single board. And this enabled the creation of uh, external sensors such as vision cameras, uh, advanced sensors like gyros, inclination sensors, force stock uh, sensors, advanced controllers like microcontrollers, DSP. Then we had areas of speech recognition, uh, then AI. So all these uh, topics actually came up about 1970s and that is essentially because electronics became smaller, faster and cheaper. And this continued to about 1990s. So this is the second revolution of robotics. The third revolution or the third generation is essentially because of uh, new materials. Now new materials, new actuators, interest in emulating biological design paradigms and we had a lot of new areas like micro, nano robotics, uh, vision, uh, bio robotics, etc. Now it is interesting to note that uh, smart materials uh, based actuators and sensors uh, gave the ability to make very, very small robots, say micro robots and nano robots and they enabled actuation in uh, different ways. For example, you could not make a DC motor which is very, very small. So if you take, this is an interesting example of uh, what we call the size effect. So this is the essential control structure of a robot or an NC machine where you have a controller. Uh, then there is an actuator uh, which can be a DC motor. Then we have a work table. Okay. In the case of an NC machine, it will be a work table or a tool. And in the case of a robot, it will be a, uh, it, will, it is going to be a link or an arm. And uh, there is a feedback by means of uh, an optical encoder, which is a feedback device. And essentially, this is my closed loop uh, control system. So the interesting part here is, if you want to make a very, very small robot, one way would be that we can shrink this, okay, make it small. And now how small is uh, small? Say, for example, uh, 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 an NC machine would be the size of uh, a table, maybe one meter, at least a length of one meter. Now, if you want to make a very small NC machine, a very small lathe machine, uh, how small would it be? Maybe 10 millimeters. So one way would be that you take this one meter lathe and you shrink it in size and you make it into 10 millimeters. Okay. The question is, would it still work? And essentially, it is not going to work because there are a lot of these components which cannot be shrunk. For example, if I make a very small DC motor, then what would happen is it will not give enough torque for cutting or for moving uh, this uh, work table. So there is a particular size to which you can shrink and after that size you cannot shrink anymore. Now this is called the size effect. So if you want to make a very small device, a very small uh, robot, then we have to use 
an actuator which is not a DC motor and we have to make links which are small which uh, link can of course be made small. We have to use uh, sensors which are also very very small right. So this uh, DC motor cannot be shrunk so we use a, uh, what is called a smart actuator to replace a DC motor and produce the actuation. So as we go along we will see some examples of uh, smart material based actuation and uh, uh, the, the, the point being that essentially because of this size effect okay, uh, we are using this uh, concept of smart materials and smart actuators came about 1990s because we were trying to make uh, robots which are very, very small micro, nano and uh, biocompatible robotics and uh, we could not make this using conventional DC motors and AC motors or conventional encoders. So this is the three generations of uh, robotics. Uh, the first was essentially because of the transistor, the second was because of uh, VRSI, the third is because of smart materials based actuation and sensing. Now the future of robotics essentially means uh, the areas in which robotics is expected to grow in the next uh, couple of years uh, or the next decades. Number one is biorobotics, emulating biology, making uh, micro and nano systems, uh, then exoskeletals are wearable devices, not only wearable robots but also wearable clothes, wearable uh, sensors, wearable actuators. Neurorobotics where uh, the, ro the robot can actually be inside the body okay, performing uh, some function or a part of the body. Robotic drugs, uh, nano robots for curing disease, surgery, then assistive rehabilitation robotics for, uh, for example like uh, uh, for stroke rehabilitation. Uh, outer space and nuclear applications. Outer space and nuclear have uh, traditionally been using robotics and they are expected to use robotics uh, uh, to continue using robotics in the future also because this is where human beings cannot go. So the only option is uh, to use robots. Uh, defense, soldier, autonomous armaments. So soldiers and autonomous armaments like drones are also becoming popular because uh, several of the countries do not want to put their soldier to harm. So one way is to use uh, automatic devices like robots to perform uh, uh, dangerous operations. Replacement of body functions like artificial muscles. Then uh, new terms which have come up, IoT, Internet of Things, Cyber Physical System. This all involves robotics and automation in some form. Okay. So this is the direction in which robotics has been going and uh, it is expected that at least in the next 10 to 20 years, these are the areas that are going to remain uh, uh, for research, for industry, etc. Now these are some examples of small. We said that robots are very small. How small is small? So this is an area which uh, this is a, a figure showing a robot which is very small. How small that it can go inside the bloodstream, and these are the uh, red blood cells. So this robot is so small that it can go inside the blood cell and uh, perform a particular task. For example, uh, killing a particular virus or uh, killing a particular cell. So it is so small that it can go inside the uh, bloodstream itself. So we are already in that stage where robots are this small and they can uh, be inserted into the body. Surgery, so this is another, uh, another case where uh, robots are expected to make uh, a great impact is in uh, surgery. Uh, for example, bypass surgery where if you have uh, an artery which is blocked, so essentially a robot can be inserted and the robot can go and drill and uh, make a clearance of whatever is, the, uh, the blo whatever is blocking the artery. So this is another area we are already in this uh, we are already in the age where robots are this small and for example this is already being done in the case of placement of stents in the in the heart uh, where a small robot kind of device can be inserted and then after the stent is played it can be taken out. So this is uh, when we say small we mean this small or smaller than this. Some uh, very strange uh, kind of applications uh, a robot dentist, a robot for cleaning your teeth. Now uh, these are very, very small robots which can do grinding on the teeth and essentially this is, uh, this is apparently a very crazy idea but then it has a lot of economic value because uh, if you go to a dentist it's very expensive whereas if a robot can do this task very easily then it would be much, much cheaper. So there are actually companies which are making such robots for, uh, uh, for commercial application. Uh, a robotic haircut, again this is there in several parts uh, of the world where uh, this is some kind of a cap where you have to wear the cap and there are small uh, blades inside which will cut your hair. Again, this is of economic interest because an automatic automated haircut is uh, very, very cheap as compared to a human being cutting a hair. If not in uh, India but at least overseas, getting a haircut is a pretty expensive affair. This is something I talked about, about uh, 
uh, about uh, the smart materials based actuators and sensors. So, this is uh, some uh, this is a smart uh, material which is a, which is an electroactive polymer and you can change its shape like that of a snake okay and uh, you can also control it. So, this is an example of uh, a smart materials based robotics where you can make very small devices. And now, a mechanical linkage system cannot behave like this. So, if you want to make something which is closer to biology or you want to emulate biology, maybe uh, what we need to do is to have sensors, actuators which are not the conventional DC motor, AC motors, but are made of smart materials. This is the example of a bird. Again, uh, this is not a mechanical device. So, it can behave like a bird and uh, uh, this again does not have linkages. It is basically made of an electroactive polymer and simply by giving it charge, it can behave like a bird swing. Then we have examples of uh, exoskeletons where these are uh, robots which can be worn and uh, they can be uh, used for enhancing uh, the physical ability of a person. For example, if a person finds it difficult to walk up or walk down uh, stairs because of uh, paralysis or uh, or the person uh, has any kind of muscular degenerative disease, then this device can help you to walk up and down stairs. This device can help you to carry enhanced load. Such devices are also used for rehabilitation, uh, automatic transport, where these are automatic uh, uh, buses which are already there in several parts of the world. They, uh, these are driverless and uh, they are completely uh, autonomous. So, autonomous transport, brain computer interfaces. So, these are, this is another example of an interface or a man machine system in which uh, instead of taking the instead of taking the input from a joystick where the person is moving, you can take the signal straight from the brain and then analyze the signal and then drive a device. So, such devices are called uh, brain computer interfaces and they are already commercially available for uh, very simple applications like uh, uh, playing games. So, for example, in the car racing game, you can put on two electrodes and you can drive the car left, right, left, right simply by thinking left or right. And uh, it is expected that in the next uh, decade or more, these devices will be much, much more powerful and uh, will be having a better interface for communication. So, for people who cannot speak or who cannot use their limbs simply by thinking, the person would be able to uh, actuate a device or be able to type. Automatic uh, uh, road tracking. Uh, for auto autonomous cars. So, the next generation of cars are likely to be electrical cars and one step ahead is the autonomous cars which uh, do not have drivers or can drive or can drive by themselves. So, this is also uh, we can call it an autonomous car, we can also call it a robot where there is no driver, it is a driverless car which can just uh, move by itself from one point to another point. Uh, driver tracking, okay. So, tracking the driver whether he is asleep, whether he is uh, uh, paying attention to the door, uh, paying attention to the road. So, driver tracking is another area. Outer space has always been uh, a favorite of uh, robotics and automation. So, uh, space rovers like uh, uh, the lunar rovers which go to the uh, lunar surface or Mars rovers which go to Mars. So, they have special structures and they have a special kind of actuation and sensing for enabling them to move on uh, on uh, rough terrain which is there on the moon or, or Mars. Then uh, we have this robotic arm on the space shuttle which is also a robotic arm which is actually helping the uh, helps astronauts to uh, perform particular tasks in outer space. So, outer space and defense has been uh, has been there and is likely to be there for robotics in the next uh, decades. Now, very interestingly uh, ethics laws for example, we always talk of industrial laws and industrial uh, uh, ethics, but uh, now that robots are living with humans and it is expected in industry 4.0 that more and more robots and humans are going to perform tasks together. So, what would be the laws uh, that would govern uh, the behavior of robots or uh, humans? Okay. For example, if there is an accident and a robot uh, uh, injures a human, then who is responsible? Is it the robot responsible or is the human responsible? So, at present moment there is no uh, laws of that nature and uh, in the present in industrial uh, standard, the robot and the human are kept separately. In, uh, so, in fact, the robot is kept inside a cage and the human is outside. So, this workspaces of the human and the robot are uh, different, but in future we are expected to be in the same workspace. So, this is becoming very important uh, ethics, uh, laws, industrial laws, uh, social laws. If a robot is staying in society, 
say for example, in several airports, we already have robots which are there. Now, what are the laws or what are the ethics that such robots should have? So there's a new area which involves not only engineers, but also people in social sciences, uh, in economics, and in uh, other disciplines as well. So this basically gives us uh, an introduction of the history of robotics, where uh, robots came from, uh, where it is going, what is the likely uh, directions of we are, what are the likely types of robots we are likely to see in the future, and uh, so on. So after this, we move on to <coughs> the next more serious talk. That is, we have seen that robots essentially are made up of joints, and uh, they are connected by links. So this is the basic structure of a robotic system in which we have, uh, uh, this is a robotic uh, arm. So this base is fixed, it doesn't move. These are joints and the two joints. So we have one joint here, one joint here, one joint here. And this joint is connected to the next joint by means of uh, a links. And at the end of it, we have an end effector or a hand to perform some task. It is controlled by means of a computer or a controller which can be a PC, it can be a microcontroller, or it can be a, uh, a DSP, which is controlling this robot. So essentially, this is the basic structure of a robot, and it consists of a controller. So we'll look at microcontrollers as we go along. It contains joints. We'll have to look at what are the kind of joints. Then uh, it also has uh, links, okay. uh, and then there is an end effector. So what we need to look at next is we look at uh, joints, what are the various kinds of joints which are there for robots. Then we look at when this robot moves in space, what is the relation between the end effector position and orientation with respect to the base of the robot. So if I want this robot to go from here to here to pick up something here, then essentially I must know what is the position orientation of the arm when it reaches there. That's how the controller works. So the next thing we look at is what are the different kind of joints so the first kind of joint we have is called a prismatic joint. And as this uh, is shown in this uh, figure, this joint is like a rectangle. So this is a rectangular section or rectangular cross section. And there is another rectangle here. So this rectangle is uh, inserted onto this uh, base rectangle. And uh, this joint uh, is called a prismatic joint. It's also called a translating joint. And uh, this joint can move up and down but it cannot rotate. So we cannot rotate this joint about this axis, right? So this is called the axis, and uh, the degree of freedom is it can translate, it can move up and down on this joint. So this part can move up and down along the inner uh, rectangle, but it cannot rotate about the axis, okay? So this is my axis, and the degree of freedom is a translating degree of freedom, and uh, uh, this is called one degree of freedom. So here, when we say one degree of freedom or a degree of freedom, Essentially, it means that uh, this is a very, what changes when this joint moves is this distance changes, and this is a pris uh, prismatic uh, degree of freedom. So this prismatic degree of freedom has one degree of freedom, uh, and it's called a prismatic joint. The second degree of freedom, uh, sorry, the second type of joint is what we call a revolute joint. So again, as this uh, as shown in this figure, so we have a cylindrical part which is mounted on the cylinder, and we have some kind of a stopper there. So the stopper is put so that this part cannot come down on this. Otherwise, it can freely slide down. Now, this is the axis of the joint. Now, in this joint, this cylinder can rotate about this axis. So either clockwise or anticlockwise, it can rotate about this axis. And uh, so what would change when it rotates is essentially this variable angle theta. Right? So this has <coughs> a degree of freedom 1. And the degree of freedom is theta, the angle which changes when this rotates, right? So this is a revolute joint, and the degree of freedom is 1, and the variable is theta. Now, this is the third kind of joint, which is called a cylindrical joint. The essential difference between this joint and this one is that we have a one cylinder, which is mounted on this cylinder, okay? And there is no stopper here. So this uh, cylinder can slide up and down, and it can also rotate. Okay, about this axis. So this is the axis of the joint. This cylinder can go anticlockwise or clockwise on this axis, and it can also slide up and down. So there are two degrees of freedom or two variables. One is this distance, uh, which can change, and number two is this angle, which when it is rotating, this can also change. So a cylindrical joint has two degrees of freedom. A revolute joint has one degree of freedom. 
the third, uh, the fourth kind of joint is what is called a spherical joint or a ball and a socket joint. This is also called a universal joint and uh, uh, this has three degrees of freedom if you can imagine an axis system. So, this is my x axis, y axis and this is my z axis. Then this can rotate about this. So, this is a ball inserted inside a cup. So, this ball can rotate in any direction. So, it can rotate about this axis, it can rotate about this axis and it can rotate about that axis. So, it has three degrees of freedom and uh, this is called a spherical joint, uh, prismatic joint, uh, sorry, uh, spherical joint or universal joint or ball and socket joint. Now, using this uh, different uh, joints, we make different kind of robots. So, if you use different kind of joints, if I use a prismatic joint here, then the motion of, <coughs> of this link will be of a particular kind. Now, if I use a revolute joint here, again this will move in a different way. So, the kind of joints that are uh, used on the robots will give a different kind of a motion ability to the robot. So, the first thing that we need to look at is what kind of joint the robot has. So, again uh, going back, this is a prismatic joint, it has, it can only have a variable distance. This is a fixed distance, but the variable is the joint angle theta. This has a variable distance and a variable uh, theta angle. This one has three variable angles, so it has three degrees of freedom. Now, if you were to ask the question that which joint system should we use, then an obvious answer would be this one. Why? Because uh, this joint has the maximum degrees of freedom. So, if you look into the human body, then our shoulder joint, our uh, hip joint, our uh, ankle joint, they are, they are all ball and socket joints. right? But if you look at uh, robots, then 99 percent robots are made up of revolute joints. They are of this kind of joints. right? So, an interesting question here would be that uh, this gives the maximum degrees of freedom, so why do not we use it? So, if you think a little bit, this gives the maximum degrees of freedom, but actuation of this is uh, a little problematic because if I put a motor here, how is this joint going to move? I have to put a motor. So, I put a motor here, I put another motor here and I put another motor here. Now, if I do that, then the shafts of the motors are intersecting at that point. Now, you uh, can well imagine that if we have three motors and the shafts are intersecting, then what would happen is it will be uh, one motor will start interacting with the other one. So, we will not be able to control them. So, in terms of control, this is uh, uh, not possible to, to control this joint using DC motors and because of which uh, we can make this joint, but it is extremely difficult to control. So, thinking a little bit, uh, uh, share, uh, just uh, look, thinking about this joint a little bit, in biological systems, we do not use motor, we do not have motors, but we have uh, linear actuators which are muscles. So, a motor and a linear actuator like a muscle works completely differently. In a linear actuator, for example, uh, in our shoulder joint, it is uh, sorry, uh, in our shoulder joint, it is basically actuated by the bicep and the triceps uh, of my of the hand plus the shoulder muscles. Now, the elbow is also actuated by the bicep and the tricep uh, muscles. So, how does the elbow joint work? If the biceps contract, the arm moves up. If the bicep uh, bicep uh, relaxes, the arm moves down. So, that is the way the spherical joints work in biological systems which are actuated by linear actuators which are basically muscles. Whereas, in robots, robots are actuated by uh, motors and motors are not linear actuators, but they are rotating actuators. So, uh, it, although this joint works in biological systems, it is extremely difficult to use this in a robotic system. So, very rarely would you see a robot which has this kind of a joint and uh, 99 percent robots would be having revolute joints essentially because each joint would be connected with a motor. So, there would be a motor here which is going to actuate this joint and each joint would have one motor with its own controller and sensor closed loop control. So, uh, uh, we saw that robots can have different kind of joints and based on the kind of joints, they would have a different structure and they would move differently. And the joints also determine the degrees of freedom of the system. So, here by degree of freedom, I mean uh, the degrees of freedom of each joint and in total, how many degrees of freedom the robot has, the robot will have that many degrees of freedom. Now, before we proceed a little uh, further, uh, uh, it would be interesting to note that uh, uh, how many degrees of freedom are required to do a task. For example, if uh, uh, we have a table, so let, let me draw a table here. So, this is a table and on the table, uh, so, these are the legs of the table and on the table we have kept a part. So, this is a rectangular 
small rectangular box that I have kept on the table. Now, I want to pick up this box. I want a robot to catch this box, pick it up okay, and uh, maybe take it up like that, take it like this and then keep it here. Okay. So, the robot should pick up this, catch this uh, object, pick it up and then keep it here. Okay. So, to do this task, how many degrees of freedom are required? Now, uh, if you think a little bit, how do we answer this question? That th there is an object which is kept on a table and we are required to catch it, pick it up and put it here. Now, how many degrees of freedom would you, uh, how many degrees of freedom should the robot have? So, essentially, uh, how do we decide or how do we solve this problem? Now, essentially, you should see uh, we need to figure out that how many degrees of freedom are required to do this task and how do we answer that? For example, this object is kept on this table. So, if I now say this is my x axis and this is my y axis okay, and this is my z axis. So, if I say this is my x, y and z axis, then this object is kept on the table means the CG of the object is placed uh, on this table, which means that it could be at any point on this table. Now, what does that mean? It means the CG of this object could be here, it could be here, it could be here, it could be anywhere. right? And on this table, if it has to be anywhere, it needs two degrees of freedom. It will have an x coordinate and it will have a y coordinate on this table. right? So, we need two degrees of freedom just to keep it on. So, we need x and we need y just to put on table. Okay, put on table. So, if you want to put on the table, then essentially we need two degrees of freedom. right? Now, uh, the robot has to catch the object. Maybe it will catch it here at this location and catch at that location and then take it up. Okay? So, it has to move along the z direction. So, along the z direction, it has to move up, down, move up or move down. Okay? So, the uh, robot will catch the object and uh, take it up along this order, then move it sideways. So, this is my z. So, one more degree of freedom for the z. Now, it has to move along x, y again. So, x, y is already accounted for here. So, it can move in this direction in x, y and it has to move down again, which is z. So, z up and z down is accounted for by z. So, so far, just to catch this object and move it up like this, like this, we need x, we need y and we need z, which is uh, 3 degrees of freedom. Now, if you think a little bit, if you want to catch this here and here, you also have to orient the fingers properly, uh, which will mean that if I have a gripper, if I draw a gripper here, so this is my robot gripper, which is catching. Okay? If you can imagine that this is the robot gripper, which is catching. So, the two fingers are placed here and here, which means that there has to be one degree of freedom which can rotate. Because if the orientation of the object, if I keep the object in some other orientation, so I kept it uh, in a different orientation, I keep the object in this orientation now, okay, which is different from this orientation. Okay? So, what, what is also required is I should be able to have a degree of freedom about this axis and hence I need one more degree of freedom which is uh, a variable, uh, which is the degree of freedom theta. So, now coming back to the question of how many degrees of freedom are required for simply picking up an object and putting it on a, another box uh, on the table, we require a 4 degrees of freedom. So, this is essentially most robots, uh, the least you can have is a 4 degree of freedom system. So, I hope this example clarifies that when we say we want to do a task and I want a robot to do that task, the first question that we need to ask is how many degrees of freedom are required to do this task and uh, the minimum is 4. Now, if you want to keep the object in uh, at an angle, for example, I want to keep the object like this now. So, there is an angle there. So, the object has been kept at an angle now. Okay? So, there is an angle here right on the table. So, if we have an angle here, then I have to add one more degree of freedom uh, which will come, uh, which will be this angle. Right? Now, if I want to keep at some other angle, then I need to uh, uh, along another axis, then I have to add one more degree of freedom. So, the minimum is 4. If you want this angle, then it is 5. If you want one more angle here, then it is 6. So, essentially robots, the minimum you can have is uh, 4 degrees of freedom to catch an object and place it uh, somewhere. And uh, if you want to include all the de degrees of freedom of the object, then it is 6. So, normally we have uh, 4, 5, 5 degrees of freedom or 6 degrees of freedom depending on the task uh, that is required. Now, uh, uh, so this answers the question of how many degrees of freedom that are required and what are the kind of joints that we have. So, now robots can be made up of, uh, uh, so if you are designing a robot 
or you want to buy a robot, then how many degrees of freedom it should have is first answered from here, that which, what is the task you want to do. And then the next, next question comes that, uh, wh what is the type of joint you're going to put? Now, depending on the kind of joint you're going to put, the robot will have a different, uh, a different uh, structure. For example, this is uh, a robot which is made up of prismatic joints. Okay. So these are, uh, uh, this robot has four degrees of freedom. This is the side view and uh, this is the top view. So we can see here that uh, in the uh, side view, this is one degree of freedom. You can, if you can imagine, this is a prismatic joint. Prismatic joint can only move in a straight line. So this is one, it can move in this straight line. This is the second one which can move in this straight line. And uh, uh, in the top view, this is the third which can move in this straight line. Or this is one, that is two, and that is three. Either way, it's, uh, it's the same, right? Now, this robot can move in three-dimensional space because uh, the prismatic joints are going to move. Now, what is the area inside which the robot can position its end effector? Uh, we have to find out so, because the task has to be inside the work volume. So this area inside which, or the volume inside which the robot can position its end effector is called the work volume. So for every robot, depending on the size, uh, depending on the structure of the, uh, of the joint, the shape and size of the work volume would be different. Now, how do we draw the work volume of uh, a robot? So let's look at uh, this particular case. This is called a Cartesian robot because it has uh, three prismatic joints. So this one has three prismatic joints. And the variables are, uh, variable is uh, a distance, variable distance. Now how do we proceed with drawing? So first what we do is we see what is the range of this robot from here to here. So this robot uh, has a degree of freedom here. So it is uh, here. Now when it moves, it moves from this point so uh, when it is here, it moves from one end to the other end. So what do we get is a straight line. So this uh, joint can move in a straight line here, right? So we get, what we get is a straight line. Next, this joint can move up and down. So it's like this straight line can move from here to here. So the straight line, when it is sweeping down and comes from here to here, what we get is this area, right? So it's a square or a rectangle depending on the dimensions uh, or the lengths of this and that. So from the side view, what the work volume looks like is a square or a rectangle. Now in the top view, if you can imagine, uh, we are looking at this uh, from uh, the top direction. So we are looking at it in the top view from here. So what, what you can see is what we essentially see is this line, right? So this area uh, is seen as a line in the top view, which is seen here. So this is my line. Uh, which is seen. Now when this joint moves, it moves from here to there uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a straight line. So what would happen is this straight line is getting pulled along this direction and it comes till here. So this is the full area that the a straight line sweeps and it comes out uh, like this. So in the top view, what we have is a square or a rectangle. In the front view, uh, in the side view, again we have a square or a rectangle which is like this. So if I combine this side view and the top view, uh, what are we going to get? So what are we going to get will be, uh, so this is my side view, and in the top view, it is something like this, okay? So what we're going to get is a cube or a cuboid, depending on the dimensions or depending on the lengths of uh, the prismatic axis. Now the robot can go any point inside this uh, cube or cuboid, and this cube or cuboid is what we call the work volume. So this uh, uh, cube or cuboid is basically called the of the three DOF uh, degree of freedom uh, prismatic ro Cartesian robot. Now in robotics, it is uh, basically written when we, uh, in terms of notations, what we write is if there are three prismatic joints, we will basically say three P which indicates there are three prismatic joints, and this is also three degrees of freedom. So this has three degrees of freedom. There are three prismatic joints, and uh, uh, the name of the robot is what we call a Cartesian robot. And uh, what's important here is uh, the shape of the work volume, which looks uh, like this, and the robot end effector. Uh, the end effector means the gripper or the tool, which is here at the end. This can go to any point inside the work volume, okay? 
So this is uh, the work volume of a three degree of freedom Cartesian robot. Now, uh, if we have a different joint structure, uh, obviously we are going to have a different work volume. So uh, the second uh, robot that we are going to look at is what is called a, a cylindrical robot. Now a cylindrical robot essentially has uh, uh, one revolute joint. Now this is from the top and this is from the, uh, the side view. In the side view, we have uh, uh, two prismatic joints like in the previous case. This joint can move front and back here and uh, in this joint, it can, this joint can move up and down in that direction. So the side view will be exactly same as uh, in the previous case where this joint can move from here to here, so it generates a straight line. Now this joint can move from there to here, so this straight line is swept downwards and it comes here. So what we get is this square or a rectangle depending on the dimensions of or the lengths of D3 and D2. Now when we see from the uh, top view, okay, the same one when we are looking from the top view, what we are seeing is uh, uh, this is a rotating joint. So this full length can move in that direction like this or it can move like this. So if you are seeing from the top view, then this, uh, this area would look like a line, a straight line. So this straight line is here, right at the center. Now this straight line is being swept in this direction and it is being swept in this direction. So the volume that we are going to get, sorry, the shape that we are going to get will be something like this. Okay? So this is the shape of the, uh, the work volume when we are looking at the top view. Now when I combine this area along with this area, what is the shape that we are going to get? So if you can imagine this is the side view and this is the uh, top view, then the shape that uh, we are going to get will be something like this. So this is my cylindrical shape okay. and uh, so this is going to be a hollow cylinder kind. Okay. So if you can imagine this is a hollow cylinder, the robot is sitting here and all area inside here the robot can go. Okay, so these are areas where the robot can go at every point inside this volume, but it cannot go here. So here it is not allowed to go. And these regions are called singular regions where the robot cannot go inside. So if you can just go back here and see when I combine this view and this view, what would happen is I would get a shape which will be a hollow cylinder and the robot can go everywhere here inside this area, but it cannot go inside this area. This is not allowed for the robot. So it's very important to know what is the shape of the robot and again here it has two prismatic joints and it has one revolute joint. So this is called a 2P 1R uh, robot. This also has three degrees of freedom. So uh, today we end uh, here and we'll continue in the next lecture.